Jeff, who put an immense amount of work into this. I'd also really like to thank our host, California Medical Center. Yay. If you have questions or you have a comment, please ask it. Be very concise. Please try not to ask the same question the first three people ask because it just becomes redundant. So what I'm going to ask is ask your question. They're going to take notes on all of the questions. And then when we close the public comment, they will answer all of your questions that have been asked. I happen to be the chief of staff here at California Hospital private practice in downtown LA for I think about 25 years. Uh, uh, good evening. My name is Peter Kern. Uh, I'm a physician also. I'm the acting director of the TB control program. I've been in that position for about uh, one month. Hello, I'm Dr. Liggins. I work for the Department of Public Health and I work in the part of public health that uh, oversees um, infectious and communicable diseases in this part of town and so I work in the Central Health Center which is on Figueroa Street and I also work in the Hollywood Clinic as well. Thank you. Good evening everybody. My name is Kristen Mundy. I work for the Department of Public Health. I'm the Area Health Officer for the Metropolitan Los Angeles area. Uh, my name is Sapna Bamra Morris. I'm a, um, a medical officer in the Division of TB Elimination at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. <coughs> By way of background, I'm an infectious disease trained physician um, and um, recently just arrived um, at the request of LA Hi, my name is James Watt. I'm the Chief of the Division of Communicable Disease Control for the California Department of Public Health. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Diane Woods. I have a doctorate in public health from Long Linda University School of Public Health. And I have worked uh, with disease control and prevention and um, health education, um, social science, social research. And I am a researcher for over 30 years. And I am here at the request of the community because we have just finished working in Skid Row um, on a statewide project of reducing disparities <coughs> among ethnic populations and I was the project director for this particular um, project which was funded by the California Department of Public Health under Proposition 63, the Mental Health Service Act. And so the community called me and asked me questions about their re the release of the announcement of the TV outbreak and asked me to, to share information about whether there was a need to be concerned in regards to Skid Row. So I am here at the request of the community and I'm very happy to be here. And my intent is to share with you some information related to uh, your risk and um, reducing your risk. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll speak for, for the department and then um, give you some information about TV. First of all, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity, for inviting us, General Jack. Um, and for giving us the opportunity to provide information to all of you regarding um, TB in, you know, Skid Row and the homeless population. The first thing I want to emphasize is um, there is not uh, a danger to the general public. The general public is not at risk. I know that in, in the media there's been um, talk about um, masks that is not recommended. Um, we don't recommend that anybody that's um, um, in Skid Row, walking around, just visiting or volunteering, wear masks. That is not the recommendation of public health. Um, because again, if you go back to how it's transmitted, it's if a person has um, active TB and it's close contact. In fact, um, if somebody was symptomatic, <clears throat> we prefer that you put the mask on the person who has symptoms to cover the, the, the mouth and the nose rather than all of us who are around. Um, so we've done a lot of um, things to control this TB outbreak. Um, we've worked with um, shelter providers, we've worked with um, healthcare providers in Skid Row um, to identify these cases. And when we identify cases, we immediately isolate them, usually in the hospital, and provide treatment. Once um, a TB person, um, a, a TB, a person with active TB disease has been taking medications, usually for about two to three weeks, they're no longer contagious. Um, 
but they have to complete the treatment for about six to maybe 12 months. Um, and um, so we've identified those, those cases, we've isolated them. We've also um, tried to identify the people that were uh, possibly exposed um, by these cases and we test them um, to make sure that, you know, to, to check if they were infected with TB. Um, and another thing that we've done um, is we've asked um, the CDC and the um, California State um, Department of Public Health um, to assist us with this investigation because we're intensifying our response. This is not unusual. We always work with the CDC and the state. We're very, uh, we have very close working relationships. Um, in fact, some of their staff are embedded um, within the county um, Department of Public Health. Um, so that's the reason that they're here. So um, at this time, um, that's what I have. I, do. I also wanted to say that we, this investigation has the same priority as any other investigation. Um, the health of this community is very important to us, and we're not doing anything unusual in this investigation that we wouldn't do in any other investigation. I really appreciate what uh, Ms. Mundy had to say about that, um, that the same surveillance techniques that we use in other investigations are the same ones applied here. And I, it's very important for me that the members of this community understand that the lives of the people in this community are as valuable for us as anybody else's lives. And the health of this community is valuable to us, and therefore we put this investigation with the same priority as we put other investigations. Um, I have some information regarding risk that I'd like to share with the, with the audience, so could someone please help me? and copied their information. And I initially wanted to just email these articles to General Jeff, but um, there were other things that I thought would be helpful. And I briefly just want to say this, because uh, individuals continue to ask, um, am I at risk? You know, uh, I have family members that have had tuberculosis before, and I'm concerned about that. And so what I, I wanted to do was just something very simple. When I'm working in education and community, I try to make it very simple. So on the first page, you will see a diagram that says when you're looking at that part a particular disease or a particular pathogen, what then is necessary to understand about it in order to see whether or not one is at risk. So you have to look at these three factors. You need to look at the host, the environment, and also the agent. And in this particular case, the agent, and we'll use this, the short term, tuberculosis, the tuberculosis of bacteria. And that's the same name as the pathogen that's causing the problem. And then you also want to look at the host, who the pathogen or the particular bacteria, or the agent is causing the problem with the host. And in this case, it's a human. Any human in this room. Then you look at the environment. Under what type of environment would this particular pathogen, or germ, or bacteria, or virus, or whatever agent is causing the problem, what would facilitate it causing the problem in the human? So you look at that. What are those circumstances? I want you to turn in this little piece of information to item number eight. But when you look at page eight, I mean item number eight, want everyone to get at it. You can see your item numbers at the top. Item number eight, and this was just a flyer from the Virginia Department of Public Health. You have your two individuals at the top. How is TB spread? So you can see there, since it is airborne, and when you have the particular, in this case, the bacteria in the lungs, and you've heard in, uh, from explanations when you're coughing or when you're sneezing 
or when you're propelling that particular bacteria out in the air. Whoever is in the particular uh, environment, and you heard the term, prolonged exposure. But when you look at the exchange or the transmission, anyone could be at risk if they are exposed to someone who has an active disease and they are propelling these bacteria in the air. Now when you look at the host where the bacteria will land, which will mean you're going to breathe it in, anyone then can breathe it in. But if you breathe it in, does it mean that you're going to have the disease? And you've heard earlier, no. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the disease. But you have to look at the individual in whom you're breathing the bacteria in. Yes. And you'll see in this booklet also risk factors. And when you look at risk factors, uh, we can turn, and that's going to be item number three. Risk factors. People who already have chronic conditions. Individuals who have weakened immune systems. Individuals who may be HIV positive. Individuals who uh, may use substance. And individuals who <clears throat> may be of a particular age group that would make them a little bit more susceptible than others. So you see a lot of different risk factors there. It will be determined if you breathe in this bacteria, whether you're strong enough that your immune system is going to just be able to take care of it, or if it is you're, you're weakened, that you then may be prone to develop the disease. So when people who are in skid row, which we have individuals, yes, that are homeless, uh, limited income, other challenging circumstances where their health is not necessarily optimal, where there may be additional stress that weakens their immune responses, where individuals interact with these individuals in different types of scenarios for a prolonged period of time. And you know when you're with your buddies, you may be having a chess game, dominoes, or something where you will be with someone for maybe 10 hours or 12 hours, maybe in a closed environment. You, and if this person is coughing, or if this person is having um, respiratory problems, in fact, you may not know that they may have uh, TB. It may be something else, but you don't know. So you ask about the risk. You are at risk at being able to breathe in whatever that person is putting out in the air. So what are the recommendations? The recommendations is you need to talk to the Department of Public Health. If you're con and if you know that you've been in that kind of environment where you've been with people for a long period of time, and especially if you know someone that's been coughing and sneezing. I cough and sneeze because I'm allergic to the pollution here. I'm allergic to smoke, but it doesn't mean that I have active TB. You won't know that either. The only way you will know is that they, the, the public health department are a provider and usually individuals who have limited income and who lived in distressed situations may not have their private provider. But you have the Department of Public Health where you can request a TB skin test if you feel that you know you've been in those types of environments. So keep in mind that it's not limited just to one place. It's the mode of transmission, how it's transmitted, and, and the conditions under which it is transmitted. So I wanted to make that very clear. I won't take up any more time because I've taken about 10 minutes already, but I provided the booklet with uh, that information regarding risk, and that's what I want people to make sure because it is a personal responsibility. There's no way that uh, individuals be able to, to find everyone that has been exposed because you have such a mobile population. So I'm concerned that individuals remain healthy and do not have unnecessary disease or succumb to disease. 
So you have a responsibility for yourself and you would know those circumstances where you've been in, in close quarters interacting with each other for a prolonged period of time. And you also know if people have been coughing and sneezing and um, do not look really well and, and, and maybe tired and, and know if they've been coughing up blood or whatever. If they, at that particular stage, that means that they're sick. But before they even got to that stage, they could have been passing along the tuberculosis bacilli. So you have a responsibility, and I want to make sure that that was clear. And again, the format is everyone will ask their questions. They'll make all the notes and get all their homework ready, and then we'll have comprehensive answers to everything at the end of the comment. Thank you. My name is General Jeff with the Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council. I represent the Skid Row residents. Um, in the reports, uh, in the news, it was basically said that there was the, this, this TB outbreak was limited to Skid Row, the Skid Row community. Um, I specifically want to know exactly what do you define as the Skid Row community? Um, because there is a, we know it as a 50 block community, but at the same time, there is, when you talk about, also the news reports say that there are shelters that are involved. One of the homeless shelters that I can think of off the top of my head is have to be a, a formerly known as New Image, which is actually maybe five miles outside of Skid Row, with 38th Place in Broadway. And so, 38th and Broadway Place. And so, um, how can it then be uh, limited to just Skid Row? when it, that it is extremely outside of Skid Row. So what are your reports in regards to it being limited to Skid Row? Thank you. I no longer live in the Skid Row area, but I lived there at one time. Um, my question is, the article in the Los Angeles Times dated Friday, February the 22nd, and it says, Feds tried to curb outbreak of TB on Skid Row. I'm just wondering, did any of the panel happen to see this article? I'm just going to read an excerpt. Public health officials have launched a new coordinated attack to contain a persistent outbreak of tuberculosis on downtown Los Angeles Skid Row area, including a search for more than 4,500 people who may have been exposed to the disease. So my question basically is, um, if the feds are concerned, how much concern should we be? And if there's anyone here from the feds tonight, since there is a concern. I've been a resident in downtown for going on 12 years. Um, I live in Skid Row, I live in permanent supportive housing. I am a person that has an immune illness, autoimmune illness that affects me. It's sort of very different as. Um, I remember when staff was around. And for me, I don't trust the county health department to tell me what's going on anymore. There were firefighters that were affected by it. A police officer, she got a heart problem as a result of it. And the county said, didn't say anything until to the community that there was a problem until people got sick. In this situation, it's the same thing with me. I really appreciate you on the end order because you understand that our community is sick. People don't live in this permanent supported housing and in those conditions because of some faults of their own uh, most of the time. We're, we're, we're sick. You have to qualify to have a disability to get a disability check. You, you really, you really, you're awesome. You're just so beautiful to me. My other issue is now that I live across the street of Main Street, I actually live in the historic core. And we still also have a lot of low-income hotels with people that are immune compromised. We, we call it the historic core, but in actuality it was, for decades, a part of Skid Row. And I consider, I mean, I make fun of it and call it Skid Row Heights. But if we, we deal, it doesn't matter if you're a millionaire or you're somebody low income. We deal, we are in constant contact with the Skid Row community. We are inextricably, inextricably connected together. So when someone starts saying that there's an outbreak in Skid Row, we automatically know that it's not just within the 50 mile boundary. So my, my, whole, my whole question to you is, why do you tell us these things after the fact? We're adults. You can tell us 
something so that way maybe we can take precautions. You know, we're not going to come, we're not going to, we're not going to sue you. We're not going to do anything like that. We know the risk, the fact of the matter where we live. The pioneers, they know the risk. The people with the, with the money. The low income people, we don't have a choice. But let us know, it's insulting. I mean, the lady's telling us how to protect ourselves. Well, um, that there's much higher numbers of TB throughout the county. Um, and this particular strain has disproportionately impacted homeless people, and I'm not at all disagreeing with the increased risk. Um, but this is not the usual percentage of homeless folks in the, in, the, in the population that has TB. There's other environments in which people catch TB. Um, so I just think there's a lot of um, questions that are framed around this being specific to Skid Row and that it, the, the outbreak that, that, that this represents LA County. Um, this represents a very small number of the cases in LA County, and homeless folks also represent a very small number of the cases in LA County. I think the big question I'm, I'm seeing from people is why now? So we're now closing public comment, and we are moving on to the answers. Maybe one of the reasons why um, it was out in the media is because we sent um, a health alert to all the providers letting them know that um, you know there's tuberculosis um, and to, to watch out for symptoms and so I don't know if the media got a hold of that letter and that's what spread this so that speaking of healthcare providers um, there was a question if we are working with them we are working very closely with um, the healthcare providers especially the ones in Skid Row which are um, JWCH the Department of Public Health is co-located um, with JWCH over at the Levy Center, or some people refer to it as CCH, Com um, Center for Community Health. There are um, a lot of communicable disease, you know, people that are um, living in Skid Row um, and because of the sanitary um, conditions, the homeless, they are at risk for um, communicable diseases. But um, Fortunately, I guess in this instance, not um, tuberculosis. It's not, like I said, it's not in the belongings. It, it's not about the sanitary conditions because, um, like I said, um, tuberculosis is airborne um, and it is spread um, from one person to another. Um, this is considered an outbreak because the definition of an outbreak really is um, um, an increased number of cases from what is ordinary. And, um, but it, it, it can be in one location, and it can be in a long span of time. So outbreak, like this one, um, it's an outbreak that's been ongoing since 2007. So there is an increase. So it does meet the definition. But I think um, that word, maybe, is not a word that should be used um, that because um, the community or the general public doesn't understand what that means. Um, just because you say outbreak, it's not, oh, no, you know, like we're all at risk. Um, and I hope that through our messaging, through um, meetings like this, um, that we're able to clarify that. There was a question um, about, um, is this specific to the homeless population? Absolutely not. Um, in fact, um, tuberculosis, um, the active TB disease that's been reported to LA County from 2007 to 2012 um, was 4,293. And I don't want to throw out numbers, but I'm only saying this to put it in perspective. Out of that, only 265 were homeless. That's 6%. So TB is not a homeless disease. Um, and I only give those numbers um, to, to give you um, perspective. Um, of, of how, you know, of what it is. One of the comments that was made was that recent press reports vilify Skid Row. Mm -hmm. And um, you're right, and um, we are very much concerned with, with um, addressing this problem with the members of this community and doing something about it. We have been providing care for everyone who has TB in LA County even those patients who are cared for by their private physicians, we have a role in supervision of that care. And so TB care is a responsibility of the public health department. And those residents who live in Skid Row have been provided with that care. 
and um, we work hard to provide them with the same level of care that we provide to everyone, regardless of their income, regardless of where they live. Um, Dr. Kern should also address the fact that there have been some cases with this same strain at other locations in California, but the problem is that there has been a concentration of this particular strain in Skid Row. And part of the reason why, why we put more emphasis on this has been that we recognize that there has been some spread among people who live together in this area. And that's not unusual, that people who live together would, and who, who frequent the same um, um, situations together, would spread TV in. So that's not unusual. One of the questions was that, uh, why, why are you mentioning the shelter that was mentioned that's not in Skid Row? And one of you hit it right on the head. This population is mobile. You don't just stay in Skid Row. You go to other places. And Ms. Mundy did mention that, that the residents of this community are sometimes bussed out to other facilities. They're the same people. They just happen to go somewhere else sometimes. And you were right in saying that what happens in this community goes to other parts of town. So it's our responsibility to address it, to take control, and to make sure that it doesn't spread anywhere else. Um, and I, am, I was happy to hear the statistic that there weren't any deaths in 2012. That's good news. Yes. And we're very proud of that. It means that we've been working harder and we've been getting better at what we do. Um. In this situation, LA County and the state both agreed that um, they should request some assistance from the CDC. We arrived um, in a team of individuals to assist LA County in this situation. Again, the local jurisdictions that has requested us. They, the local jurisdictions remain the lead investigators. We are merely here to support them. And often that is defined by providing surge capacity. So when there's a lot of information or data or um, information to, to manage, a lot of planning to do, we provide that assistance to a local jurisdiction and serve them. This is what neighborhood councils around the city are all about. They're about representing you to bring the stakeholder, the elected, the appointed, the experts together to give you information and make it a safer, more open and transparent city that we're supposed to be living in. So I want to thank all of you for being here. I know that it was a little longer than you might have expected. I just have one something. On the back of this little handout that I gave, there's a space for you to put the Department of Public Health telephone number. When they said that they wanted to be contacted okay. or uh, send any Please get a number from them so that you can put it here so that you can refer individuals to whomever at the Department and, of Health. And we may keep the rest of those? You can have those. Thank you. Yes. So please take a look at that website that's there underneath the banner and go there, sign up for, for mailings. We have lots of different categories that you can sign up for, which is general information. If there's something that you'd like to have come to the Neighborhood Council, please get a hold of us. That's why we are here, to do things like this, or things that are much smaller than things that you need. So we're here for you. Thank you. Thank you.